Hey all, welcome back. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about metformin and mTOR inhibitors as compounds that can improve immune competence, especially for individuals that have accelerated biologic aging. Now, this is an important conversation. It's not really a new conversation, but the data, unfortunately, although there's a lot of studies that have been coming out and we're going to talk about, especially this one right here by past podcast guest, Matt Caberline. The title here is the potential of Rapalogs to enhance resilience against SARS-CoV-2 infection and reduce severity of COVID-19. Now, this is not going to be just a COVID specific conversation because we know that influenza and other viruses and even immune defects are linked with, say, cancer, higher mortality from various infections, diabetic infections, for example, foot ulcers. And we know that compromises within the immune system can worsen various chronic diseases. Now, these two drugs that I just mentioned, metformin, we're going to talk about rapalogs or rapamycin and everolimus, and there's RTB-101. There's all these different compounds that we're going to get into, and I want to make it very simple for you. Essentially, when, we, when you talk about a drug or a pharmaceutical Often individuals who are interested in natural health and exercise are like, whoa, what are, you, what are you doing, man? It's a drug. It's bad. The drugs that we're talking about here have a very low side effect profile and have a lot of upsides. And the way that we're going to talk about these drugs and make the case that they could be used by individuals who have accelerated risk for various diseases, have accelerated biologic age and advanced chronologic age, they may want to consider these drugs periodically. This isn't something you do forever. In fact, this might be like a micro dosing one day a week, a five to eight milligram dose of rapamycin or, or metformin every other day for like five or six weeks and then taking time off. And there's a, there's a really interesting case to make for these compounds. Again, especially for individuals who have some underlying health issues that they're working on to accelerate the impacts of the healthy living and exercise. So there's been, by the way, a lot of retrospective studies that have looked at reduced mortality from this particular virus with individuals who even don't have full-blown type 2 diabetes, but they're using metformin. And this is really interesting. So I just, I want to share this research with you because it's not getting a lot of airtime. But here's a little fun fact before we get into it. Metformin is one of the most prescribed drugs for prediabetes, diabetes, and type 2 diabetes, right? It's been used throughout the world. It's, I think it's generic at this point. Guess what? Its first applications were not for, like when it was discovered, um, it was not used for diabetes. It was found to, guess what? Improve recovery from influenza. So that was its first sort of mechanism of action. So you're like, wait a minute, this widely distributed drug for diabetes, its first indications clinically we're actually to improve recovery from a viral infection? Like, how could that possibly be? We don't really hear about that. So that's a hidden little kind of underlying, you know, message here that things that support metabolic health have an improvement in the body's immune response. Because as you age and become more insulin resistant, guess what happens? Your immune system loses its competence. So when you think about exercising, when you think about compressing your feeding window, when you think about eating more real food, sure, you're being supportive from a from a standpoint of improving metabolic health, that is affecting your body's immune competence, which is good because diseases like cancer sort of proliferate out of, contr out of control when you have immune incompetence from being overweight, from being insulin resistant, and much more. So this has a lot of impacts here. So let's dive into first how we're going to sort of structure this conversation. We're going to talk a little bit more about immune incompetence, some of the characterizations of aging, of particularly accelerated biologic aging and mTOR inhibition and make the case for periodic microdosing of mTOR inhibitors. Now, it's interesting. I'm personally interested in this because I've been trying to get my parents on rapamycin, microdosing rapamycin, like five milligrams, eight milligrams, one or two days a week for a while um, because it's been shown to help individuals over the age of 70 and I want them to be around. Now they're doing great. They're exercising, they're eating real food, but I have a personal interest in this research and I'm sure you have parents or people in your life that you know that are above the age of 60 and you want them to be around as well. So this conversation uh, is important to a lot of people, especially because there's a lot of research to support this. In fact, you may even want to consider your aged dog to give them rapamycin. And, you know, there's this dog aging project that Matt Caberline, he and I talked about in the podcast that we filmed, you know, it was, it was I think, September of 2020 when that was published. So if you want to go back and listen to that, we, we talked a lot about rapamycin, mTOR inhibitors, and how periodic use of these drugs can help dogs improve their lifespan and can reduce 
uh, cardiac uh, hyperplasia and some of the some of the challenges like congestive heart failure that's frequently the leading cause of mortality in dogs. Um, anyway, fascinating stuff. But let's dive into the the that, and then we're going to get into metformin uh, here towards the end and so forth. So, as we age, the immune system loses its efficacy. So we know that. It's known as immunosenescence, and this affects both the innate and the acquired or adaptive immune system and greatly reduces the production of T cells and B cells. So we hear a lot about T cells. Well, we hear a lot more about antibodies in the media. Antibodies are made, of course, by B cells. Now, your T helper cells, your T lymphocytes, help instruct and orchestrate this adaptive immunity by your B cells. So this is really important. The people who are advocating for vaccine mandates should be really in favor of inhibiting mTOR and considering rapamycin, especially for people that have chronic health conditions or are over the age of 60, because these drugs have been shown to improve the immune response to vaccinations. But it's funny, the advocates for vaccine mandates, I have never heard any one of them talk about ways that we can make sure that these vaccines are going to be sustained and not have a waning effect. So that's kind of interesting. But again, aging affects these T cells, part of the adaptive immune system and B cells that make the antibodies uh, in the thymus and bone marrow. Consequently, decreased antibody production leads to fewer T cells and B cell interactions and reduced release of thyroid hormones. That was new to me. This is also leads to a decrease in natural killer cell activity. We've talked about exercise, vitamin D, and natural killer cells. Really important connections there. Definitely um, go back and listen to that podcast if you're interested because I think that was informative for a lot of people. So we know that older people are more prone to have chronic low-grade background smoldering pro-inflammatory status along with elevated plasma biomarkers like interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, C-reactive protein. Uh, And in the absence of clinical symptoms, they just have this background smoldering inflammation, which by the way, there was a correlation. One of the earliest studies that's been referenced 700 times at this point was interleukin-6 is correlated with viral load. So individuals that are infected with COVID that go into the hospital, um, their viral load was independently correlated with interleukin-6. Now, if, so if you have a lot of background chronic inflammation, your IL-6 is elevated, you know, it, it goes, it, it's, it makes a lot of sense tele, teleologically that you're going to have higher viral load. You're going to have, you know, a, a sort of stressed in the immune system and not have a sufficient immune response initially and have challenges there. So just Keep that in mind. It gets expensive to measure these interleukins and cytokines. That's why I recommend getting a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. This is a good proxy, a way to approximate interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, okay? So as we go on, on a cellular level, this background smoldering inflammation translates to enhanced inflammatory activity, uh, especially in monocytes and macrophages of the innate immune system that work in a reciprocal fashion to enforce ongoing chronic inflammatory processes, which are all no good, okay? These ongoing chronic inflammation also, guess what? That is linked with the acceleration of insulin resistance and worsening of glycemic control as you age. So we know that. Uh, People that are 60 and so-called healthy have worse glucose control than their 20-year-old version of the same individuals. We need to understand that. So all of this to be said, this collective outcome of this smoldering low-grade inflammation is a compromised immune response and increased incidence of inflammatory comorbidities, uh, cancers, age-related neurodegenerative disorders like dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and much more. And, And those... Conditions also further weaken the immune system. So really interesting stuff from this this paper. But the big take home here is Matt Kibbeline et al., who runs a geroscience lab at University of Washington, has postulated that the relationship between chronologic age and poor COVID-19 outcomes is driven by biologic aging mechanisms. Okay, so we need to understand that aging biology plays an important role here. And, you know, this has been more widely appreciated amongst clinicians and researchers. And so this leads us to say, well, if we know that we can affect biologic aging with possibly things like metformin and rapamycin, why are we not considering these when it comes to saving lives? There's all this talk about saving lives and and being responsible and every life. We got to do every little thing to keep people out of the hospital. Well, why aren't we recommending a drug that has a very low side effect profile Okay, so rapamycin is used in very high doses in individuals who, say, have a kidney transplant or a liver transplant because they're used as immune suppressants when they're used daily at high doses. We're talking about one day a week. Okay, so that's what some of the studies have actually shown in humans and also animals like dogs is pulsing this, microdosing one or two days a week, five milligrams, 
can actually have a, a, a regeneration in the immune system that lasts. I mean, this is what's really important. So let's get into this, some of the studies. So if we could restore the immune function in older adults, we would have a benefit beyond just improved immune response to say influenza or COVID, right? So it's been known that even before COVID, um, more than 1 million adults uh, over the age of 70 and more than 2 million deaths in, in people of all ages annually uh, die from just your garden variety flu, right? So the flu kills people. We don't really talk about that anymore, but it does and it still will. So if we can prevent deaths from the common flu, uh, we can save lives. And again, these drugs have been shown to um, both improve the immune response to a flu vaccination, but also have lasting favorable reductions in sickness and illness long after the drug has been stopped. So it has this regeneration effect, probably, this is speculative, but purging those senescent cells in the immune system. Okay, so reversion of age-related changes with also within the microbiome uh, could be expected following mTOR inhibition as the immune system plays an important role in maintaining a healthy microbiome. So this is so-called this inside-out control of microbiome health. We hear a lot about probiotics and fermented foods, and I talk about these all the time, and recommend them to people and, and yourself. But it turns out that your immune system crosstalks with your microbiome. So if you have a, an aged or dysfunctional, dysregulated immune system, then you might have an altered microbiome. So here is the rationale for the study design and, and the, the doses here recommended for rapamycin. Should you, you know, work with your family doctor or your parents' doctor to talk about this? And so what they're saying here and suggesting, and again, this was published in uh, this was in the Lancet, Perspectives of Healthy Longevity in, uh, in this year. I think this was September of 2021. So they're saying general study design. Ideally, this would be a double mass placebo-controlled trial. And we suggest enrolling older adults over the age of 60 um, who are predicted to have a biologic age that is at, ye at least five years older than their chronologic age. And they're recommending five to 10 milligrams of rapamycin one day per week. So guys, friends, gals, when you think about Oh, rapamycin, that is normally prescribed for people that are preventing a rejection. That they don't want to have a rejection of a, of a transplant. They're doing 20 milligrams every day. You're in 5 to 10 milligrams, potentially, one day a week. Completely different dosing, completely different effect. So it's not going to suppress your immune system. It will help sort of regenerate and improve the immune competence. So really uh, important stuff here to consider. And we're talking 6 to 8 weeks and taking a break. So Matt Cableine actually recently did a podcast with Dr. Peter Atia. I want to say it was August or July of this year. You might want to revisit that and they talk about he had a, um, Matt had a frozen shoulder, which is actually linked with chronic inflammation. And he was like, you know what? The doctor said, you know, there's not much we can do here. We can get you some cortisone, get you some steroids. It's like, I'm not going to do that. And he took some, some rapamycin just for a couple of weeks and had a, a improvement in his shoulder. So again, I think this is an important consideration. So friends, before we go on and talk a little bit more about glycemic variability, aberrant blood sugar levels, I just want to welcome you all back. It's Mike Muntzel. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. If you're enjoying this content, please hit that like button. Leave a comment below. That really helps the algorithm. And you can always share this with a friend. Just send them a text message. Say, hey, you might want to check out this video because we're about to get into some really cool stuff about blood sugar health and its correlations with poor outcomes with all sorts of infectious diseases, but particularly the one that you're hearing a lot about in the media. Now, as we continue on, I just want to remind you about a new promotion that we have going on, the new Electrolyte 6 from Myoscience. Buy one, get the second one 100% discounted. This ends on the 31st of October. So you want to check this out and take advantage of this amazing opportunity because you are going to dig this product. It's a real salt derived uh, electrolyte combination formula with Albion chelated minerals and taurine and creatine. It's never been done before, friends. This is one of the best electrolytes hands down that's out there. It's delivered in a convenient stick pack. It's priced very well. Not a lot of funky natural flavors or anything like that. So definitely check it out over at myoscience.com. You want to take advantage of this pre-sale opportunity because you are going to dig this electrolyte. Okay. So let's continue on and talk about glycemic variability as it relates to issues here. And then we're going to talk about metformin. I want to build up the case here for metformin because, again, now I've already said this, but I want to say it again. When you talk about metformin or rapamycin or any drug, there's a sort of natural reservation. People are like, whoa, a pharmaceutical dude, you're, you're a health guy talking about a pharmaceutical? Yes, everything in context. Metformin is actually derived from a natural compound. It's, I think a biguanine. I can't remember what plant or where, but but this is most most of these drugs in pharmacology 
are somehow extracted or mimicking a natural compound. Some are fully synthetic, you know, um, through different, uh, you know, chemical reactions and things like that. But rapamycin is made, to the best of my knowledge, by a bacteria. And metformin is derived from some compound in nature. So again, yes, this is like patented and, and made by, you know, pharmaceutical companies and so on. But we know that these things impact the body favorably. And I'm not suggesting you, you go on these compounds forever. This is periodically, especially for people that have a history of metabolic disease and obesity and are trying to improve all of their healthy living, you know, parameters, this could be an accelerant of sorts. And if you don't want to consider metformin, you could try berberine. They function very similarly. Okay. But it's really important. A lot of people don't know that poor glycemic health, especially at the onset of hospital admission for COVID-19 is actually a predictor of mortality and death. And so um, really important stuff here. This was a study here, the association of early phase in hospital glycemic fluctuations with mortality in adults uh, from COVID-19. So this was a study in April of this year, finding that glycemic variability was linked with mortality. People that had more aberrant blood sugar levels, presumably because you know insulin resistance, had worse outcomes. And so there was this linear association here uh, between longitudinal changes in abnormal fasting blood glucose levels and outcomes in people with that didn't have a previous diagnosis of diabetes. So if you look here, this is the probability of survival in individuals that had really high uh, blood sugar levels. It was only 40 days. Like So at day 40, the probability of survival was essentially zero, right? So if you go in the hospital and your blood sugar is off the charts because you have COVID, after 40 days, your probability of surviving is zero. <laughs> this is insane. Compared to people who come to the hospital and their blood sugar levels is fairly normal, their probability of survival is 80% after 40 days. So this to me is, is quite fascinating. So this study goes on to say 89.29% of the patients with the high stable pattern, they had a more propensity to clot and throw a blood clot. So their levels of D-dimer, which is consistent with the results from uh, other studies, uh, were much higher. And so this is linked with a multisystemic inflammatory response syndrome that tend to uh, really lead to negative outcomes and death. So um, this clinical trial reported that hyperglycemia also uh, enhances coagulation. So clotting and reduced neutrophil degranulation in patients during systemic inflammation. So there's a correlation between insulin resistance, glycemic variability, and the propensity to clot. So we need to understand this. Uh, again, this virus is now endemic, so we should be caring about blood sugar health. And the data uh, is quite clear. Again, and just background, this study actually looked at 230 patients that were hospitalized uh, without a previous diagnosis of diabetes. So that's really important stuff. Okay, let's finish off here with metformin. Various studies, and these are retrospective studies. You know, one was done at Kaiser Permanente. I think they looked at blood work from like 20,000 subjects and found, wow, guess what? We, who would have ever thought that these metformin users compared to non-metformin users, you know, they did you know, matching of, of age and adjusted other factors. They had a lower incidence of mortality. Like this should be front page news. But friends, metformin is off patent. It is cheap. I think, you know, uh, your insurance, you're, they might charge you five bucks a month for this, all right? Now, one thing to consider with metformin use is taking B vitamins like methyl B12 and folate because we know these B vitamins can be helpful. Uh, and actually, the use of this drug can deplete these vitamins, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so this paper right here, outpatient metformin use is associated with reduced severity of COVID-19 disease in adults with overweight or obesity. So again, considering context, you know, if you're, if you're really physically fit, you're eating real food, you've been fit for your whole life, maybe metformin, considering that, may not be for you. But if, if you're someone who's like just now getting into health and starting to lose weight because you've been overweight for a while, it could be an adjunctive therapy for, for you. These, these authors go on to talk about how this could be a synolytic type therapy where metformin could be used to purge some of these senescent cells, and that could be, could be helpful. Uh, and so forth. So this is really interesting here. And there's yet another study here, mTOR inhibition in COVID-19, a commentary and review of eff efficacy in, in uh, RNA viruses. So uh, another uh, aspect here, another uh, bunch of different studies. This was published actually in December of last year. But it's important to, to just recognize that various studies have actually shown reduction in disease severity and hospitalization with metformin use. So Again, you might want to say, well, who should consider you know, metformin? Well, you might want to check out your hemoglobin A1C levels. And so we did a, a video all about what is a hemoglobin A1C. 
its correlations, high levels of hemoglobin A1C linked with poor outcomes, uh, with various diseases and all cause mortality. So for $79 and you can save using the coupon code HIH5 over at checkout at biocoach.io. And that's just a way to look at your long-term average blood glucose levels and see if you're at increased risk for uh, having glycemic variability and, and fluctuations like we've been talking about. Um, and if you do, you may want to consider obviously healthy living and healthy exercise and you know uh, intermittent fasting potentially, but you may want to consider something like a natural berberine or even go to your doctor and look at metformin. Uh, if you're over the age of 60 or if you have underlying health conditions and you feel like you're aging faster than maybe your chronologic age you know, suggests, you could talk to your doctor about microdosing rapamycin uh, one day a week, you know, five, 10 milligrams as Caroline et al. had suggested. So uh, I just wanted to share with you, I want you to have access to this data, the data that you're not hearing about from the pundits that we often hear about on TV. So really important stuff here to check out. And um, I will link some of these articles in the show notes. And I think this is just really interesting stuff. But it seems that there's a trend if a drug is off patent, we don't really hear much about it. And that that's not new. That's been going on for a long time. But um, if we're serious about saving lives, we should also consider off patent and natural therapies that have been shown to be effective. Um, you know, metformin tends to be one of those. So anyway, friends, as always, I'm grateful that you tuned all the way in. Thank you for hitting that like button. Thank you for subscribing. Hopefully you found this helpful and we will catch you on a future video and podcast down the road. Until then, be well. Catch you all later. Bye now.